All right. So um, I am pleased to invite Frank Wadenberg from the US Military Academy to present on differential equations, one course and a lifetime of modeling. And I open it up to you. Super. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody. This, this meeting has been really good. Um, I'm enjoying it a lot. Um, I particularly appreciate all the work that that the folks at Simeon have put in. This is very, very smooth. And it's it's difficult to make things um, run this smoothly. So big round of thanks for everybody, first of all. So um, this is the cover slide, the kind of introductory slide. And the most important thing up there is my email address, um, because I hope that this is just the start of a conversation. And I look forward to hearing, hearing from people in the future. <clears throat> I've also got a website um, that accompanies this. And there's some links on there and some other information. And you can get that website either by typing in the URL that's up there, or if you scan um, the QR code, um, that should open up your browser um, with that. So um, the title is Differential Equations, One Course in a Lifetime of Modeling. And the really important thing here is that modeling is essential for understanding and bettering our lives. And we're gonna talk an awful lot about that. Um, it's not just a lifetime of modeling, it's the habit of getting into modeling every day, everywhere, whatever you're doing. So I'm gonna go on to the next slide. And I've got three points that I wanna make. Um, the first point is that ordinary and partial differential equations are one paradigm in a growing modeling toolkit or repertoire. And what we want to do, <coughs> excuse me, is we want to use a whole toolkit. I'm going to emphasize qualitative methods and quantitative methods and that whole toolkit. Um, to be honest, I'm less interested in the kind of algebraic solution, the of, of differential equations. I think we can do an awful lot without that. So that's the first, the first point I want to make, that ordinary and partial differential equations is just this one paradigm, and we want to use a whole toolkit together. Um, the purpose of modeling, um, or the scientific method, and really the same thing, is building an understanding of our world and giving us the power to change our world for the better. So that's the goal of all this. And the third point I want to make is that modeling is a habit of mind. It's lifetime, it's every day, it's everywhere, and it's around the house. So if, if um, we had more time, I would have asked you to assemble a little kit of stuff. Um, for example, if you have Polaroid sunglasses, you can do some pro pretty cool experiments just using those. But we don't have that, that kind of time. Um, I have two pictures below. Um, to illustrate the fact that modeling is, is everywhere. Um, on the left, you see a picture of the Mid-Hudson Bridge. And bridges are a great place for modeling. If you're interested in network theory, bridges are links in action. Um, this particular bridge, and it, all bridges are also great for differential equations for things like, oh, we model the, the um, suspension cable and th things like that. Um, this particular bridge, I was walking across it one day, and I ran into this guy by the name of Joseph Bertolozzi, and he had some drumsticks, and he was banging on the bridge. And we stopped and talked, and I got a course in partial differential equations from him. And um, what you'll see on the left there is, it's a picture of, it says bridge music, and you can actually press various buttons, and he you get recordings of pieces he's recorded. So he's a really, really interesting guy. And if you Google Joseph Bertolosi, um, you'll go to his website and you'll find that he's got wonderful videos of him playing music. He's running around, he's banging different parts of the bridge and he's playing music on the, on the Mid-Hudson Bridge there. And he did the same thing with the Eiffel Tower in France. So it's really, really great. And of course, you don't need a bridge. Um, it's not clear to me anybody's allowed to go around bang bridges to make noise anyway. Um, you can do that just with metal things you find around the house. So modeling is everywhere all around you. So the plan is that I will probably do more talking um, during this first 25 minutes. And what we plan to do is stay in this room and we'll hang around and we'll have an open discussion um, after this is done. And I hope we'll talk about three things. Um, the first thing is just experiments and observations 
that you can do around the house, around your neighborhood, just things that, that you've done. Um, I hope we'll talk a little bit about experiences with chat GPT, um, things like text-based. Um, when I wrote this, uh, it was text-based image search, but I'm now, of course, um, Microsoft is un, uh, has opened up a search engine so you can do text-based search in general. And, and image generation, all the things we've seen that are generating images. And then I want to talk about ideas for modeling high stakes decisions. And there's a little thing down there at the bottom, but we're going to look at that um, more largely later. The big picture is that the modeling we're talking about as mathematicians is just the beginning of the modeling we need to do for making decisions. So this is by far the most important slide that I'm going to show. Um, when we model, we typically start out with a very simple model just to get some traction. We make lots of oversimplifications, um, lots of assumptions. We build a model, then we use what's the traditional part of most traditional math classes. We use mathematics, often some simulation to analyze that model, see what its implications are, its predictions, and then we compare those predictions with the real world. And usually, they don't they don't match. So we go around that cycle over and over and over again, building progressively better and better models that are more and more useful. But the basic idea is modeling is not just a simple short problem. It's an iterative process starting out very simply and then building to more uh, ever more useful models. I could just as well, this is exactly the same picture. The only difference is I've changed it, the label to the scientific method. Same thing, what scientists call the scientific method, we call the modeling cycle. Okay, here is the picture I promised earlier. So suppose we're talking about modeling for something like COVID-19. So the mathematical part of it, the traditional mathematical part, we're trying to understand how the pandemic spreads, what we can do to, to maybe slow it down a little bit, but there's much, much more to it than that. Typically, there are many different goals, and often those goals are conflicting goals or apparently conflicting goals. So, for example, if we're talking about COVID-19, um, one of our goals is to lower the peak number of people infected. We want to shorten the pandemic. Those two might actually be, be contradictory goals. Um, we want fewer deaths. We want less long COVID. So we've got a whole bunch of different goals, or as we, we call them, metrics. So one of the things we do um, when we're teaching a math class is we give lots of different problems that are very similar. And one example is take the same basic model and analyze it from the point of view of different, different goals, different metrics. So we've got this, this nugget of a problem in the middle, um, and then we're analyzing it um, with different goals. Okay, but then, um, we've got different stakeholders. We've got parents. We've got students at different at different levels. We've got business owners. We've got child child care workers. So we have to understand modeling for personal public policy decisions, especially when they're controversial. In the context of multiple stakeholders, um, we have to bring in ethics and values and so on to decide what which goals. Um, are more important and what the trade-offs are. And particularly, we have to talk an awful lot about how you handle um, when you've got goals that really are conflicting. If, if at all possible, you want to avoid those zero-sum situations, ways to do that. So much, much more, we want to apply our modeling skills, not just the original kind of scientific part of it, traditional scientific part of it, but also to the decision-making part of it. So here is a, a typical, it's actually from Kurt Bryan's Differential Equations book. This is a typical, um, and actually a very good introduction to the SIR model. And that's traditionally what we do. It's, it's great, it's wonderful, it's one of the best things I've seen. But in the spirit of what I've been saying, I would like to suggest that we substitute this. So the difference here is that we flip the SIR in the context, and it's now obvious that we're making lots and lots of assumptions. So susceptibles, well, there's 
lots of different people that are susceptible. There are people who are immunocompromised, elderly, obese, poor, wealthy, doctors and nurses. So that S compartment, which traditionally from a mathematical standpoint, we, we stir up and it's homogeneous is not really. So we emphasize the fact that from the very beginning, we're making lots and lots of assumptions. And so again, exactly the same content, but we're emphasizing the fact that in the beginning, what we're doing is we're making all these simplifications. I just put this slide up because I wanted to remind us all of what things look like, um, I guess two years ago now, two and a half years ago, just to put us back at, at our setting back then. So one of the first things we wanna do is it's, we call it the SIR model and the R often means removed or recovered. But in fact, when we're talking about COVID-19, we wanna make a sharp distinction between the people that are re recovered, presumably well enough again, and people who've died. So one obvious, slightly more complicated model is to make a distinction between recovered, healthy again, and deceased. Um, I really wanna emphasize quantitative methods. So this is kind of the traditional model. Um, this is, happens to be a mathematical notebook. It shows what's going on. And I wanna emphasize a couple of things. Um, the first thing I wanna emphasize is that this is much, much easier to read because we use words like susceptible and infected and recovered. And you can do a lot, you can do everything with this, you can do with analytic solutions and much more powerful. So I really wanna emphasize using quantitative methods um, because it gives you much more flexibility and all the power really. So one of the things I wanna emphasize is that differential equations are just one tool. So I, I really like agent-based modeling and NetLogo is a, a wonderful tool for doing that. Um, I recommend in the, uh, in the website, I've got a link to Walensky's book on agent-based modeling. And here's an example of an agent-based model um, exactly the same model, except now you've got a bunch of different agents running around and they infect each other and recover and they die and things like that. But with an agent-based model, I can do a lot of things. For example, you'll notice there's a move switch here that says on off. And um, this is the first model I ran. And in this particular case, everybody kind of stays in one place throughout the day. And you'll notice that at the end of this particular period, um, 200 people roughly um, have, have recovered and there were two fatalities. The move switch is on. Um, and the next thing, I've changed the mood switch to off and I've changed the model. So now, I'm sorry, in the first model, people were actually going off to school or a place of work or something. In this model, um, they're actually staying in one place. So they're, they're working or studying at home, whatever. And all of a sudden, you can see that you had fewer people recovered and fewer fatalities, basically fewer people got infected. So by doing an agent-based model, you can try all sorts of different things in a very, very easy way. Here's another example. Um, one of the things we often look at is Lotka Volterra models, where we've got two species interacting with each other. And the uh, two equations, top are the standard equations that we look at with the Lotka Volterra model. Um, I want to call attention to the coefficients A11 and A22. Those coefficients model how each species affects itself. And then the other two equations, A12, other two coefficients, A12 and A21, those are the inter-species coefficients. They model how each species affects the other one. The example down here, the inter-species coefficients are smaller in absolute value than the intra-species coefficients. And in that situation, you have um, coexistence. So this is kind of the standard analysis we do with phase diagrams. And we see there's an equilibrium point in the middle um, where they coexist. Um, there are unstable equilibrium points on the edges, basically, where um, just one species dominates and really, really, really pretty picture. What I've done here is I've looked at a different model 
Now this one's agent-based. It's based on the same basic idea, except in this case, if you look at the two interspecies coefficients, um, they're actually higher in absolute value than the two intraspecies coefficients. And what that means is if we did that phase plane analysis, we'd find out that co coexistence um, was not a stable equilibrium. So what happens is typically one species wipes the other one out. So what I've done here is used NetLogo to do an agent-based model. And I've added into it an element of geography. So what happens is each agent is interacting just with the agents around it. And in the beginning, on the left, you'll see that the, the red agents and the blue agents are kind of intermingled. And as this thing runs, basically what happens is you get these red areas and the blue areas. It sounds, sounds familiar, typical um, geopolitical thing. And after a while, you see there's some red areas and some uh, blue areas, and they've got borders between them. If I ran this a little bit longer, what you see is that those borders turn into straight lines. Um, because basically, if you're in a kind of a something that sticks out, you're, you're surrounded. And you can do all sorts of things like this. Wonderful to watch these things evolve. Great kind of modeling. So I think agent-based modeling is a really nice adjunct partner with differential equations modeling. These two to go together in very, very nice ways. So when we do discrete models, whether they're discrete time or discrete space, um, we often go back and forth between discrete models and continuous models. And the key kind of equation is that f prime of x is approximately f of x plus d of x by minus f of x minus d of x over 2x. That's the finite one finite difference form of the first derivative. And we use that in two ways. When we're analyzing a model numerically, we use that to find numerical solutions of differential equations. That's what you see on the right. On the other hand, we also use it when we're building models. So we conceptualize a model using this agent-based idea or a discrete-based idea that helps us build a continuous model. So the important thing is that that kind of equation, that kind of connection between the continuous and discrete really has a dual use. We use it in both, both senses. So um, one of the things I'm very, very interested in is quantum phenomena and quantum computing. And I think those are important because they're going out in two ways. First of all, they're going to really challenge our modeling ability. These things are very, very difficult to understand. And secondly, I think they're going to provide some new modeling paradigms. So if we think about physical modeling, physical modeling provides all sorts of um, language analogies. So we talk about an election campaign or a football game. We talk about momentum. Um, we talk about things like inertia in an organization. Those physical ideas are actually very useful when we start talking about other, other kinds of situations. So we really need to understand um, quantum phenomena and quantum computing, and it's tough. And basically, we, we really need Isaac Asimov. Isaac Asimov was particularly good at helping us understand, really deeply understand um, some, some tough ideas. So one of my favorite books is a book by Isaac Asimov called The Collapsing Universe. And he basically introduces general relativity, black holes, all that sort of stuff in a very, very comprehensible way. And that's what we need to do. So the two really difficult things we need to understand are superposition and quantum entanglement. I'm not gonna try and do that. We only have 25 minutes, but what I'm going to try, going to try and do is suggest how we might lead up to that. So I wanna start with an example of the scientific method or the modeling method, this interchange is going back and forth between the real world and the modeling world, the model. And understand it in, in kind of the easiest and most straightforward way. So I particularly like um, a, what's called a color paddle set. 
you can buy these um, from a company called Rainbow Symphony or from, uh, from Amazon. And it has a set of uh, color gels and some diffraction gratings and some polarizing filters. And it's a really nice thing. And I'm gonna talk about some experiments we could do with that. If we were doing this in person, um, um, my wife Margaret and I are actually cutting up little pieces of colored filters and we pass them out. They aren't as nice as these, but you can do the same kind of experiments with just little pieces of, of stuff you find around the house, basically. So I'm gonna start out and we're gonna look at, we're gonna start out with a model of color and color is a nice model to start out with because we can see color. And the basic model we're gonna use is the red, green, blue model. And it's based on the physiology of our eyes. Our eyes actually basically have three different kinds of color sensors. They're red, cone, red cones, green cones, and blue cones. And red cones, as you might expect, are sensitive to red light. Green cones are sensitive to green light and blue cones are sensitive to blue light. Um, we use that very same model on your computer screen. Um, your computer screen has three different kinds of LED, LEDs or phosphors, depending on what it is. Red phosphors, green and blue, and all the other colors are mixtures. So white is a lot of red, green and blue equal amounts. Um, black is none of anything and grays are equal amounts of the three colors. Um, all the colors we, we perceive are mixtures of red, green, and blue. So I'm gonna look with that basic model, the red, green, blue model of light, and we wanna understand how red gels work, green gels work, and blue gels work. And what I'd like to do is posit if we had more time, I'd actually ask you to, to come up with two different models for how they work. Um, the first model on the left is called the blocking model. And what the blocking model says is that the red gel, for example, blocks blue light, blocks green light, but lets red light go through. Second model, I'm gonna call it the paint model. The gel actually takes a more active role. What the, paint, what the paint model says is that a red gel lets red light through unchanged, but when green light comes through, it changes it to red. And when blue light comes through, it changes it to red. So we've got those two different models for how, how these things might work. And you, you probably think you know the answer and that's fine, but I'd like you for the moment at least to think of those two models as being equal candidates. So we've got two competing models for how these things might work. And I'm going to give you like 30 seconds. And I would like you to do, what I'd like you to do is design an experiment that you could do to choose between the two theories. So theoretically, we've come up with these two possible models. And now we want to go back and design an experiment that can let us choose between those two models. So I'm just going to be quiet for about 30 seconds. And then we'll we'll look at what we might do. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk in a few minutes, there'll be more of a discussion, but for now, here is um, the first experiment. So what we're gonna do um, is we're gonna make a sandwich of a red and a blue gel. And the blocking model says that if white light passes through the red gel, only right will get red will go through. And then when it hits the blue gel, nothing's going to get through. So what we should see when we put white light in is we should get black at the end. Doesn't make any difference which order we do. If we had the blue, if light passed through the blue, blocking gel first, and then the red, we'd get black. On the other hand, the paint model gives us completely different results. The paint model says, if we pass white light through the red gel and then through the blue gel, we'll get blue. And if we pass it white light through the blue gel and then through the red gel, we'll get red. So the paint model makes a very different prediction than the, the blocking model. And notice it makes a difference what order we put the two gels in. We can do the, oh, okay, the blocking model, again, I'm gonna do another experiment. Um, 
Yellow light is a mixture of green and red. So according to the blocking model, if you pass white light through a yellow gel, you'll get green and red, which is yellow. And then if you pass that through a, a cyan gel, um, blocks red and lets green and blue through. And then if you pass yellow and then cyan, you get green. If you do cyan and then yellow, you get green again. So the blocking model describes what, in, in this case, if you have a sandwich of red and of yellow and cyan, you're going to get green and it doesn't make any difference what order. So we, we design a couple of experiments and we can carry out those experiments. And here's an experiment and you can see that the blocking model seems to um, predict what actually happens here. And again, what actually happens here. So what we've done is again, this is kind of the ideal kind of modeling scenario. Um, we, we started in the real world, we made some observations, we came up with a couple of models, we designed a second trip around the modeling cycle, we designed an experiment to help us um, choose between them. Okay, now I'm going to switch to polarized light. And polarized light is a really good thing to look at if you're um, on the way to understanding um, quantum mechanics. So here, if, if you had a couple of uh, Polaroid glasses, it would be great. Um, I use, if, if we were meeting in person, I'd actually hand out a bunch of polarizing filters. You can do some really interesting experiments. So if you happen to have a, some Polaroid glasses, um, if you're looking at a computer with an LED screen, if you look through those glasses and you rotate them, what you'll discover is that the light that's coming through a Polaroid uh, from an LED screen is actually polarized. You can do some really interesting experiments, and it turns out that understanding polarized light, you really need a more active model, more like the, the paint model than like the um, blocking model. So this is a really interesting set of experiments you can do with stuff found around the house, things like Polaroid glasses and so on. Um, to understand the stuff, so one of the best tools everybody has is your um, cell phone. So cell phones have really, really good point light sources. So almost all cell phones, at least all cell phones I know of have a flashlight app. And you can just use that to cast shadows on the wall. And if you do that, you'll find out that you can make a shadow look bigger or smaller by putting the cell phone closer or further away from, the, um, um, from your hand, if you're using your hand to cast shadows. Um, that model breaks down if you start playing with diffraction gratings. And diffraction gratings, again, are, are everywhere. Um, they're very cheap. And with laser pointers. And what you see is that breaks down. So all of a sudden, this kind of geometric optics model of, of light breaks down. Um, the model we use is um, based on waves. Again, we see waves everywhere. We see them in puddles and so on. And if you were to print this out on transparency film and kind of overlay one on top of the other, you'd have a homemade ripple tank. So again, experiments we can do at home with things that are found around the house or maybe printed out from a website. So I want to talk about um, different kinds of models. So there's descriptive models and there are explanatory models. What we really want is models that explain what's going on, not just what, decide, what describes them. So the difference between the Ptolemaic model and uh, uh, between Newton's laws and um, you know, saying things travel in ellipses or um, whatever, that, that explanatory model. <clears throat> One of the really important things is that we want models that are falsifiable. So one of the problems with physics right now, especially with string theory, is um, there are so many different parameters that you can basically explain almost everything. And that's particularly true also with some of the machine learning models. So one of the problems with some of the models we're seeing now is that they're so, you can tweak them in so many different ways that you can fit almost anything. So Lee Smolin has a wonderful book called The Trouble with Physics and it talks about that. And I also wanna talk about machine learning versus human learning. So a couple quick, one of my favorite, uh, so if, again, if we had, uh, if you happen to have 3D glasses on and you look 
through those glasses at that picture, you'll discover that you're immersed in a picture. You feel like you're on Mars looking at the Ingenuity helicopter. And I put this picture up because we use the word see in two different ways. We use it to see physically, but our eyes are not the only organs we use to see. We use our brains. And so our brains see two different two-dimensional images and they reconstruct this three-dimensional image. So it's very important to understand that sight, that seeing is not just your, your it's not a physical thing, it involves your brain as well. Um, one of my favorite um, projects is something called Cultural Cognition. Um, it's at Yale by Dan Kahan. And it really, it really talks about how what we see is filtered through our cultural, how we understand. One of my favorite books is a book called Seeing and Thinking Fast and Slow. It's called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Um, I highly recommend that if, you've, if you haven't looked at it. And um, what I wanna talk about now is how that impacts modeling and decision-making in high stakes, often controversial settings. So we'll talk um, in the next section. I really want to hear people's experience with chat GPT and things like that. So this is a website that you can go to. It was actually, um, it's actually designed for artists who want to see if their, their work has been essentially stolen. And you can basically enter a text that describes an image and it will go out and it will search it's its library of images and return images that he fit that it thinks match that and you can actually use that to kind of see if your images have been essentially used without your permission in this database of course now um bing now has uh, a similar thing that will look for um text-based things so a new element in all of this is Actors driven by artificial intelligence and machine learning that pass the Turing test. Um, I think that tells us more about um, us than it does about the, the agents we've got now. George Santos passed the Turing test too. And I think the problem is that an awful lot of what we see out there is, is not, not terribly uh, realistic. So one of the things we'll talk about next um, in our meeting is just people's experience with chat GPT, what they're thinking about that. And um, okay, so um, what I'd like to do is think about, again, talk about this idea of modeling goals and stakeholders in the context of how we might wanna use things like chat, chat GPT, basically robotics and artificial intelligence driven agents. Okay, so the one final thing I want to ask, I want to um, point out is I mentioned that um, physical analogies give us lots of terms for understanding things. And one of the most interesting things is the difference between bits and qubits. So a bit is something that's zero or one, it's on or it's off. Qubits are much more complex. They're very high dimensional things. and until you try and me measure them, they only become zero or one, basically. And I think that we often think of, especially in these highly polarized days, we think of people as being red or blue, Democrats or Republicans, whatever Hatfields or McCoys. But I think it's actually very interesting to think that we may, and we probably are much more like qubits. We're much more highly dimensional like that. And on any given issue, whether we come down in one camp or another may depend very much on how, how we're being measured. So I think that's a very interesting um, analogy, another analogy, another paradigm that we may use in some of our modeling. Okay, so we're back to where we started and um, I'm gonna take a breath and what I hope we'll do is just have an open discussion and I think we can just go ahead and get started. And I hope that people talk about three things. Um, first of all, experiments and observations they, they do around the house, especially things that involve just ordinary equipment, things that you find. Um, your experiences, your thoughts about chat GBT and some of these other tools, and also your ideas for how you talk about modeling with high stakes decisions 
in, in the classroom. And in particular, it's interesting to use as a, as a possible topic there, how we're gonna use artificial intelligence, machine language and robotics. So what I'm gonna do is stop sharing now, and I hope we can just talk. Okay. So the floor is open. So if you Hello, can you hear me? Yes. What one uh, one experiment I do with my students in differential equations just uses a um, a thermometer and uh, you can do Newton's law of cooling very easily that way. You just need like a glass of water and a thermometer and uh, you can do Newton's law of cooling. Cool. I'm sorry, I forgot to turn my light on so I don't look like a ghost. <laughs> cool, cool. So here, here's an interesting experiment that's kind of related to that, that um, a friend of mine who's a climate scientist does. Um, and this is an experiment that is, um, she uses it to, to talk about the greenhouse effect. So she takes two thermometers and she parks her car out in the sun and she puts one thermometer in the trunk and one thermometer in the passenger compartment. And what you see is that the, the temperature in the trunk stays much lower than it does in the passenger compartment. And you know, the, same, the same kinds of gear um, and it's, it's great. You know, you're just using your car, you're using your, your parking lot and, and thermometers. So Frank, this is Chris Arney. You hear me? Oh, hey Chris, how you doing? Yeah. So um, one of the things with this high stakes uh, decision making and uh, many of your models is of course, you, you need to go outside of mathematics into another discipline whether it be science or humanities or somewhere else. And sometimes, at least when we're doing that alone, we get into quicksand or we get into places where we have to make so many assumptions as you, as you uh, uh, indicated, or we have to come up with lots of parameters. Um, but if we get partners or we get uh, ways in which we can, can develop a more multi or interdisciplinary approach, then the mathematics can be, I think, even, even more powerful or more um, interesting in the, in, the, in the sense of our own and students' uh, uh, points of view. Uh, is, is that something that, how, how do we kind of get that? How do we get there? How do you get there in research and how do you get there in, uh, in classrooms? So a, a lot of that is is pure serendipity, to be honest. I mean, we, we, we you and I have talked about this before. We we all have individual stories, but so you know, for example, I was walking across that bridge and I happened to run into yeah. Joseph Berkowski. Pure pure luck. Um, I was flying on an airplane once and happened to sit next to somebody and we got to talking and pure luck. Um, some of the earliest um, collaborations I did, um, my kids were on a swim team. And um, there were other people whose kids were on the swim team and we were kind of stuck in the, this hot <laughs> pool for, for, you know, for two and a half hours, watching our kids swim three times for two, two minutes. And we you know, were doing things like doing the starting guns and stuff like that. And we, we just happen to meet and talk. So a lot of it is, is serendipity. It's meetings like this, where you come to a meeting and you, you run into people. I'm hoping, um, that's why I put, put my uh, uh, email address up at, up at the top. I hope that these things will continue. And I think you know we really need um, to, to present as many opportunities for serendipity as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me add just a little bit. I think that Simeode and other places that use modeling for some aspect of mathematics um, have enabled us to see this potential and enable these connections to be made. And I think it is slowly 
been changing, if you will, mathematics and science. We've, we've become more quantitative in many disciplines, I think because of a, a, a steady uh, serendipitous <laughs> connections, but in the classroom and, and, and in research, but, but I think we're, we're still, we're still just beginners at this, I guess is what I think. And someone like you who does this a lot, you know, paves the way, but there's, there's, there's many of us who, you know, aren't so quick at that. Don't find those moments. And, um, I guess, I guess one of the things I'm talking about is being open to these new ideas and experimenting maybe in class or in your own, you know, problem solving and research. Uh, that's the only way to kind of move forward in those, those elements, those ways. Yeah, I'm mean, definitely, definitely. Any, any others, what, what have other people done? How, have, how have you started your, um, cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary collaborations? Can I, can I pitch in? Hi, Jacques. Hi. So very interesting. And I think this notion of, uh, of mathematics and modeling occurs in daily life around the house can be extended. In fact, I uh, started two years ago to introduce references to movies in my modeling and differential equations class. And so especially in the modeling one, I do modeling in biology, so virology, ecology, the traditional uh, topics, but I try to give a contemporary flavor to it. For example, the predator prey problem is actually and, and the, the competition model you mentioned, coexistence, and I put on the planet Naboo. So I show a clip of uh, competition in the ocean on planet Naboo. And in virology, I introduced a world famous virologist, James Franco from Planet of the Apes. So, I ask at uh, teaching evaluation what the students think about it. And I ask them if they see that as a nuisance or, but they enjoy it. Of course, they're not familiar with most of the movies I mentioned, but still they, they enjoy it. So I think it gives them a feeling of these concepts do occur like in real life. And I think the, uh, the pandemic was sort of a learning experiment learning experience for many people that mathematics can be useful and all the debate about assumptions and does it work, does it not work? And as you mentioned, SIR is good in some contexts, but not in others. And it has to be, I mean, the re real life is more subtle than the equations. And in my research, I do collaborate with people who are not mathematicians. And I tell them, well, it's very easy for us to introduce uh, confinement and reduce contact rates, you just put the parameter equals zero in the equations. In real life, it's much more complicated. So I, I think people get a feeling of how useful it can be, but also how difficult it is to implement. So that's my daily life experiment. Yeah, I think there's a huge amount of collaboration with, with different kinds of artists. I, I, I'm, I'm an amateur photographer. And some of the most interesting interactions I've had with Pete is with people who are photographers. And it's, it's really, so um, almost every photographer I know had the same story about the, the uh, beginning of the pandemic. And it kind of goes like this. They, they had some incredibly cool thing planned and all of a sudden it was canceled and they were stuck in their house. <laughs> and what they did was they got out their camera and they started walking around their neighborhood and taking pictures around their neighborhood. And they, they began to see what was going on around the house. And um, I think, so I think um, photography in particular is one of the really interesting places where we've made good use of artificial intelligence and, and machine learning. Um, so I think that that artists make very natural partners, and that partnership goes goes two ways. Um, on the one hand, um, we we need science and mathematics 
have always been very good at providing tools to, to artists. And of course, the big thing right now is everything to do with virtual reality and mixed reality and things like that, where we have whole new genres of, of art that are based on what we can do um, with the mathematical modeling and the, and the uh, computer programming. But it goes the other way as well, that art helps us understand um, some of these mathematical models. Um, we really can understand things better when we visualize them. One, one, of my, one of my favorite stories is I have an uncle. Um, and when I was growing up, um, Uncle Al could explain absolutely any, everything. I mean, he was absolutely wonderful. And um, my son Marty asked me to explain holograms to him. And I said, and he was about 10 years old at the time. I said, Marty, you're in luck because we're going to go visit Uncle Al. And Uncle Al will be able to explain it to you. I said, I know partial differential equations. That's my understanding of, of holograms. And but he was 10 years old and he didn't know anything about partial differential equations. So a week later, we drove up to Uncle Al's house and Marty flung the door of the car open so hard that I thought it was gonna break the hinges. He goes running up to the doorway, knocks on the door, Uncle Al, Uncle Al, explain holograms to me. Uncle Al looks down and says, well, Marty, tell me what you know about partial differential equations. And that's a, that's a telling thing that that you you that's not the kind of understanding um, that that we need. We we need people like Isaac Asimov. We need we need you know people who can draw pictures that can help help us understand what's going on. So I think I think that partnership between the arts and mathematics and the sciences is incredibly important. I'm curious, is anybody what what's happening um, with chat GBT at your at your institutions? What are what are what are people saying and thinking and doing? Uh, some people are panicking. But I think what uh, many people have not realized is that many of the traditional uh, curriculum is already available on the web and has been for a number of years. So there's a change in um, level of uh, availability, but I think the most um, panicking people are the ones who have not paid attention to what's available on the web. Interesting. Other, have people had experiences with, with these tools? What do you think? Well, I, I read a report that Chad GPD uh, thinks that square root of four is irrational because you use the same proof as the square root of two. <laughs> really? Yeah. I uh, recently had real analysis last semester and I know a couple of my classmates tried to use it to write like an epsilon delta proof. Um, and it seems to like use all of the right vocabulary. It's just like it's verbiage and grammar or like the thinking process isn't there so it seems to know what words to say but it really doesn't get like the logic and order along with it um and i know there is a uh a youtuber who's like who made like the number file channel he also has like a physics based one called 60 symbols and in that a uh, physics professor spoke about um how they can create the code to like mimic things in quantum mechanics but the theory behind it um is incorrect and that uh, it makes the fatal flaws that he looks for in his students to see if they actually understand versus the material instead of just coding out something to do it correctly yeah. my two favorite experiments are um i gave i gave it a problem that eric Mazur uses and it's it's a really interesting problem so he he actually does this in the classroom and he takes um two a, a big plank you know huge like it's an eight by two plank i don't know maybe 10 feet long or something and he rests it um uh, at two ends on the, on top of scales and um if you stand on one scale say he weighs 100 kilograms for the sake of argument he doesn't 
if he stands on the 100 kilo on one scale, that weighs 100, and the other one weighs zero. And then he walks across it, and as he walks across it, the, as it gets farther from one scale, that weight goes down, and the weight on the other one goes up. And we get to the other one um, under that end, the other end is now zero. If he takes one step further, he gets the tip, and he almost falls over. Very, very dramatic. And um, he, he likes that problem because then he asks students at the end of the semester um, to explain uh, what they saw. And it really indicates basic misunderstanding because they almost all misremember what they saw. They've, they've torqued um, what they saw into their, their pre-existing ideas. So I actually wrote a problem like that for chat GBT and chat GPT produced a beautifully written, beautiful analysis, totally wrong. I'm just absolutely completely wrong. So it clearly had absolutely no understanding of what's going on. And it, you know, it, it just, it looked, it looked absolutely beautiful. It really did. Um, I've also asked chat GBT to give um, uh, citations um, for work. And what it does is it again it produces beautiful citations that are are they're often by authors who you would expect to write things in journals that that you would expect that work to be published, and again totally made made up. And you can ask GBT for a, a synopsis um, or pricey of of what those articles say. And Chat GBT produces these beautiful well-written praises that are just totally made up. So it's, it's <laughs> my experience is that chat GBT is incredibly dangerous. On the other hand, um, it's apparently very good for programming. Um, if nothing else, it can give you snippets of code that are quite good. And, and if nothing else um, helps you understand some of the syntax, not understand, but gives you correct syntax. So it's, it's actually really interesting to see what, what it's going to do. I've heard that some professors have been using it as like a learning experience in their class where like they propose a question, they get its incorrect answer. And then they then ask the students like, where is it going faulty with its reasoning here? So you kind of get like kill two birds with one stone. You're both teaching the students the content that you're trying to teach them. And then you're also incentivizing them not to fully rely on it and to trust it, to just give everything um, correct all the time. The other thing I think we need to do is we need to we need to start playing with it now because it's going to get better and better and better and in the sense that the the most obvious flaws are going to get covered up and um, it's important to understand it now while while we can kind of see those obvious flaws. Any other thoughts? Uh, anybody have any thoughts about using that framework I put up as a framework for, for talking about high stakes, controversial topics um, in classes, the kinds of things that, that, you know, especially if we live in Florida, we have to be very careful about. Cool. Okay. Well, if there aren't any last thoughts, um, again, let me remind you of, of what my um, Gordons are here. I'll put this back up, and um, I hope I hope you'll get in touch. Um, take a look at that website if you'd like, and I hope we get to um, continue this, this conversation into the future. Thank you all for coming. Thank yeah, you so thank much, you. but thank you all for being here. Thank you so much for an amazing presentation, Frank. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Bye all.